live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2017, brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Red Hat Summit. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Stu Miniman. We are joined by Jim Wasco. He is the Vice President of Open Systems at IBM. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. So before we get into the new ways in which uh, IBM and Red Hat are working together, give us a little history on, on the IBM Red Hat Alliance and, and, and contextualize things for us. Oh bit. sure, sure. So uh, we started with Linux back in the very late 90s um, as a strategic initiative for IBM. Uh, and so Red Hat was uh, one of the key players at that time. We worked with other Linux vendors who no longer exist. Uh, Linux Care was one of the companies we worked with, Mandrake, you know, thing, things along those lines. But Red Hat has been a constant through all of that. So we started in the very early days uh, with Red Hat. Um, and we had an x86 line at the time, uh, and then as well as Power and Z. And even in the very early days, we had ports of Red Hat uh, running on uh, IBM, all of IBM's hardware. And the alliance is, is going strong today. Yes it is, yes it is. So we, we have that long history. And then as, as Red Hat transformed as a company uh, into their enterprise software and, and RHEL in particular, uh, that really matured as far as our relationship was concerned. And uh, uh, I'm the engineering VP with Red Hat. Um, and uh, we've just had a very strong collaborative relationship. We know how to work upstream. They obviously work very well upstream. Uh, we've worked in the Fedora project as a staging area um, for our platforms. And so, um, um, yeah, we've known each other very well. I've been working uh, on Linux at IBM since November of 2000. So. Jim, so, you know, IBM, long history with open source. I mean, I remember when it was the billion dollars invested mm -hmm. in, in Linux. Uh, we covered on theCUBE when power became open power. Uh, companies like Google uh, endorsing open power. Bring us up to speed as to open power, how that fits with what, what, what you're doing with Red Hat and what you're talking about at the show here. Oh yeah, so open power was really about opening up the hardware architecture as well as the operating system and firmware. Uh, and so, um, as that's progressed, Red Hat has also joined in that Open Power Initiative. If you look at when we started, uh, uh, just a small group of companies kicked it off, and today we're over 300 companies, uh, including Red Hat, as a part of the Open Power Foundation. Uh, they're also board members, so that they've uh, is a, a key partner and strategic strategic partner of ours, uh, they've recognized that it's uh, an ecosystem that um, is worth participating in because it's uh, very disruptive. And, and they've, they've been uh, uh, very quick to join us. Well, that's good. You know, we talked to Jim Whitehurst about how they choose and they look for communities that, that are you know, going to you know, do good things for the industry, for the world, uh, you know, for, for, for the users. So um, it, it's a nice endorsement to have Red Hat uh, participate, I would think. Oh, it is, because you know. uh, they don't enter into anything lightly. And so their participation really is a signal, I think, in the marketplace uh, that this is a good strategic initiative um, for the industry. Where do you see as the biggest opportunities for growth going forward? Opportunities for growth, uh, there's quite a few. Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that Linux is really the underlying engine for so many things uh, that we do in the technology world. Um, it's everything from embedded into the automotive industry. Uh, if you've got onboard computer, which most new cars do, 80% of those are Linux. Um, if you talk about web serving, websites, front ends, it's Linux, you know, uh, I, I know with my, um, my mom, she's like, what do you work on? And I say, Linux, you know, and she's like, is that like Windows? And I'm like, no. And, and then uh, I tell her, you know, mom, you've used it uh, probably a dozen times today, and then I give her examples. And, uh, and, and so, all the new innovation tends to happen on Linux. If we look at Hyperledger and, Hi Hyperledger and block blockchain in particular, good example. That's one that takes a lot of collaboration, a lot of um, coordination if it's going to, to have a meaningful impact in the world. And uh, so it starts with Linux as a foundation to it. Um, so any of those new technologies, if you look at what we're doing with quantum computing, for example, uh, it takes a traditional computer to feed it and a traditional computer for the output, and we don't have time to go into the details behind that, but uh, Linux fed 
uh, as a part of it because that's really where the innovation is taking place. Jim, Jim could you expand a little bit more on the Hyperledger and blockchain piece? Uh, a lot of people are still, they, you know, I think they understand Bitcoin and you know, di digital currency there, but it, it's really some of the you know, distributed and open source capabilities that, that these technologies deliver uh, to the market, mm -hmm. have some interesting use cases. What, what, what's the update on that? Oh, you that's know? that's a good question. So, um, a lot of people think of Bitcoin, and that's a, a very limited use case. Uh, as we look at Hyperledger, we notice that it could be applied in so many more ways than just a financial kind of way. Uh, where we've done it is logistics um, and supply chain. Uh, we've implemented it at IBM for, uh, uh, for our supply chain, and we've taken data uh, from weather.com, company that we acquired, uh, and we use that for our logistics for end of quarter, for example. So that's a, something that was easier for us to implement because it's all within our company, but then uh, we are expanding that through partners. So that's an example where you could do supply chain logistics, you could do financials, but really in order for that to work, because it's a distributed ledger, you need everybody in the ecosystem to participate. It can't be one company, it can't be two companies. Um, and so that's why very early on we recognized we should jointly start up a project at the Linux Foundation called Hyperledger. Um, to look at what's the best and how could we all collaborate because we're all going to benefit from it and it will be transformative. So what what are you doing there? Because as you yeah. said, these, these do present big challenges because there has to be buy-in from everyone. Yeah, so, so if I look at uh, the Hyperledger project specifically at the Linux Foundation, we've got customers of ours, like JPMC, for example, uh, founding member and participant. We've got uh, distribution partners, we've got technology partners all there. Um, and so we uh, contributed early code, stuff we'd done in research as kind of like a building block. And then we have members both from research and a product development side of the house that are constantly working in that upstream community on the source code. And, and, con and continually contributing, and, and is there, okay, that. Yeah, well, continually contributing, that's on the technology side. Mm -hmm. On the business side, we're doing early proof of concepts. Okay. Uh, so um, we worked early with a company called Everledger that looks at the um, history of diamonds and tracks them beginning to end. And the ultimate goal of that is to eliminate blood diamonds from the marketplace. And so if you know, it, it, it's also a very good market to begin because it's a limited set of players. So you can implement the technology, you can do the business processes behind it and then demonstrate the value. Uh, so that's, that's an early project. Um, most of the financial institutions are doing stuff, whether it's stock trading or, or what have you. Um, and so we're doing early proof of concept. So we're taking both technology and business, you marry them together. Uh, as as uh, Jim Whitehurst said the other day, you know, what's the minimal viable product? Let's get that out there, let's try it out, let's release learn. Release early, release often. Yes, and then modify quickly. Don't start with something that you think is overly baked and find that you have to shelf it in order to, to, to kind of backtrack and make corrections. And what is it like to mesh those two cultures, the technology and the business? I mean, do you find that there is a clash? Uh, we have not. Um, now, at IBM, it was not a simple transition back in the late 90s. There were people that thought uh, open source uh, would be just a flash in the pan. Um, here we are so many years later, that's not true. Uh, and so, uh, early on, like I said, there were a lot of internal kind of debates, but th that, that debate is, is long since settled. Um, so we don't have that. And if you look across our different business divisions, even within our company, um, whether it's cloud, whether it's cognitive, um, whether it's systems business, all use open source. Um, whether we contribute everything externally and we're using third party packaged or we, we consume it ourselves. Uh, and, and we see that as happening across the industry, even with our clients. Some that you might think are very traditional, uh, they recognize that's where the um, innovation is taking place. And so you always look at balancing um, is this viable, is it healthy? Um, or is still the commercially available stuff the better stuff? Uh, just a quick story, um, I had a development team and we were doing Agile and we needed a tool to do, to track our, our sprints and everything like that. And so all of my developers were open source developers and so that's their bias. If, if we're going to use software, it has to be open source. They went and evaluated a couple projects and they found open source software that had been abandoned. 
They were smart enough to recognize we also acquired a company called Rational, and Rational Team Concert does this, but it's proprietary. And so they initially resisted it, but then they looked at these open source projects and saw, if we pick up that code, we maintain it forever and we're alone. That's as is, is worthless you know, as, as, as it can be, because there's no benefit. Doing open source where you have multiple people contributing, you get a, a, an point. added benefit. So they went with our, our in-house stuff, Rational Team Concert. Just showed the maturity of the team that um, even though they think open source is, is really the best thing in life, um, you got to balance the business with it. Yeah. Jim, so if we look at the adoption of open source, it, it took many years to mature. Today, you know, talk about things like cognitive, it, it's racing so fast. Give us a little bit of look forward. You know, what's changing in your space? What are you looking forward to? What, what would we expect to see from you by the time we come back next year? Sure. So. Um, a lot of what you've heard here at the conference, so a lot of things that we're doing um, are often offered in a cloud platform or uh, as a hosted service or as a service. So for example, we do have blockchain as a service available today. Uh, and uh, uh, it's running, the back end is um, mainframe cloud, um, for example, running Linux. Uh, other examples of that, um, looking at new applications for quantum computing. Well, that requires cybernetic uh, uh, freezing in order to keep, keep those uh, qubits alive. And uh, so that's a hosted thing, and we actually have that available online. People can use that today. So I think you're going to see a lot of um, early access, uh, even for commercial uh, applications. Uh, early access so people can try it, and then based on their business model, like we've heard from clients uh, this week, uh, sometimes they'll need it on on prem and uh, for various business reasons. Another time they can do it on the cloud, and we'll be able to provide that. But we give them early access uh, via cloud and and as a service. And I think that's what you're going to see a lot of in the industry. And it's this hybrid mix, as you said, yes. some on prem, some off prem. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, Jim, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate you sitting down with us. You're welcome, and thanks for your time. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. We'll be have more from the Red Hat Summit after this.